coming up on The World Today. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo makes an unprecedented visit to an Israeli settlement in the West Bank. Report finds Australian elite troops killed civilians during the Afghan war. Plus, Brexit trade talks suspended after EU aid tests positive for the coronavirus. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Akaite Afia. Israel's military occupation has received a symbolic U.S. stamp of approval after Secretary of State Mike Pompeo toured a Jewish settlement in the Israeli-occupied West Bank, marking the first such visit by a top U.S. official. The trip comes a year after Mr. Pompeo said the settlements did not contradict international law, reversing a long-held U.S. position. The declaration outraged Palestinians who oppose settlements on land they claim for a future independent state. Mr. Pompeo has also paid a similar visit to the occupied Golan Heights. President Donald Trump last year officially recognized Israeli sovereignty over the strategic plateau, which Israel seized from Syria in the 1967 Middle East War and annexed in 1981. In the Trump administration, America stands with Israel like never before. Indeed, the commitment we've made, the ironclad commitment we've made to the Jewish state uh, will continue. Uh, it was, I'm confident that after our conversation this morning, we, we talked about how we can protect Americans and Israelis in the region from the regime in Tehran. You talked about this. They remain, we should not take for granted, they remain the foremost state sponsor of terrorism in all the world. And Israel has provided outstanding support to our pressure campaign, which we have no intention of relaxing. Thanks to your tremendous efforts to carry out President Trump's maximum pressure campaign, Iran's feet have been held to the fire, and we have seen a reduction in the amount of uh, support that they are given to their various uh, proxies in the region. Those who claim that your 12 points are either unnecessary or unrealistic simply want to give Iran a free pass. A free pass on Iran's atrocious human rights record, a free pass on Iran's support for terrorism, a free pass on Iran's aggression in the region, a free pass on Iran's menacing missile development, and worst of all, a free pass on Iran's plan to develop nuclear weapons with the express purpose of annihilating Israel and conquering the Middle East. The tyrants of Tehran deserve no free passes. VOA's Linda Gradstein joins us from Jerusalem for more. Linda, welcome to the program. Thank you. So this trip marks the first time a U.S. Secretary of State has officially vis visited settlements, a deeply provocative move that previous American administrations went to lengths to avoid. So how is it being received in the region? Well, I think it depends on uh, where you're coming from. So for the Jewish settlers who live there and their supporters, both in the Israeli government and in Israel, to them, it's it's a wonderful thing and they're very excited about it. Um, Secretary of State Pompeo said that uh, produce and goods from the West Bank can now be labeled made in Israel. Um, for Palestinians and those on the left of the Israeli spectrum, uh, it's a terrible thing. And they are very frustrated with this. At the same time, several Palestinians said, well, you know, it won't really matter because uh, they can do what they want. And in a few months, uh, President Trump won't be around anymore. And they are hoping that uh, President-elect Joe Biden will have a different policy towards Palestinians. So it is a change in U.S. policy. At the same time, uh, it's not clear if it's a permanent change or more of a symbolic temporary change. Well, on Thursday morning, he held talks with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem. So what came out of those talks? Well, you, we just saw a little bit of the clip, and they obviously discussed Iran, and Israel is uh, concerned about what will happen in Iran. Uh, they also, uh, Pompeo also announced that um, the um, boycott, divestment, and sanctions the BDS movement is a cancer and is anti-Semitic and that the United States will work against it. Uh, it's not clear exactly what steps the United States will take against it. But again, this is really pretty harsh language as far as the Palestinians are concerned. 
Well, speaking of that, Pompeo also announced that the U.S. would brand the international Palestinian-led boycott movement against Israel as anti-Semitic, as you said, and bar any groups that participate in it from receiving government funding. So can you tell us a little bit more about this and any talks of who these groups he implied might be? Sure. So um, the BDS movement uh, calls for a, uh, a, technically calls for a boycott of any goods uh, made in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. In other words, the, the pre-67 border is what the Palestinians and most of the international community says should eventually become a Palestinian state. Um, some Israelis claim that in practice, it actually calls for a boycott of all of Israel and, for example, has tried to um, lobby universities in the United States not to invite Israeli uh, academics to come visit, Has lo have lobbied government companies not to have any connections with Israel. So it's not sure, it's not clear exactly what that would mean. Um, but many Palestinians, uh, both here in uh, the West Bank and Gaza, uh, Arab citizens of Israel, as well as Palestinians living abroad, do support the BDS movement as a nonviolent way to uh, criticize Israel and to protest Israeli policy. So uh, he used very strong language calling the BDS movement a cancer, saying that it is anti-Semitic. In a statement, the BDS movement said that the United States uh, under Trump has gone for white supremacy and things like this and, and denied that they have any kind of uh, racial issues and say that they, uh, they fight against this. So uh, there's a lot of anger among Palestinians here today. All right. Well, Linda, thank you so much for joining us today to bring some clarity to the situation. Thank you for inviting me. Well, moving to other diplomatic issues, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has held talks with African President Ashraf Ghani in Kabul at a time when peace talks between the Afghan government and Taliban representatives have stalled and violence is rising. This is Mr. Khan's first visit to Afghanistan since assuming office over two years ago. It is the highest profile visit by a Pakistani official to Kabul since peace talks began between the Taliban and the Afghan government in the Qatari capital of Doha. And it comes days after the Pentagon announced it would reduce the number of U.S. military personnel in Afghanistan from 4,500 to 2,500 by mid-January. Mr. Prime Minister, you come with a, with a series of very important messages that you yourself will articulate. But fundamental to this is that violence is not an answer. A comprehensive political settlement for an enduring peace within the, the framework of our values, our constitution, and the Islamic Republic is the way to the future. Pakistan played its role in um getting the first the Taliban to talk to uh, the Americans and then the intra-Afghan dialogue. And we uh, noticed with concern that the level of violence, despite the talks in, in um, Qatar, despite the talks, the level of violence is rising. So uh, my idea of uh, choosing this time to come was to assure you that we will, Pakistan will do everything Whatever is possible, we will do to help uh, reduce this violence and, in fact, move towards a ceasefire. A long-awaited report has found that there is credible evidence that Australian elite soldiers unlawfully killed 39 people during the Afghan war. The Australian Defense Force, or ADF, has released findings from a four-year inquiry into misconduct by its forces. It said 19 current or ex-Special Forces soldiers should be investigated by police over killings of prisoners farmers or civilians in 2009 to 2013. The ADF blames the crimes on an unchecked warrior culture among some soldiers. To the people of Afghanistan, on behalf of the Australian Defence Force, I sincerely and unreservedly apologise for any wrongdoing by Australian soldiers. I've spoken directly with my Afghan counterpart, General Zia, to convey this message. 
Such alleged behaviour profoundly disrespected the trust placed in us by the Afghan people who had asked us to their country to help them. The report notes that distorted culture was embraced and amplified by some experienced, charismatic and influential non-commissioned officers and their protégés who sought to fuse military excellence with ego, elitism and entitlement. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Boris Johnson says he is ending the era of cutting defence spending to better address a more perilous international situation than Britain has faced since the Cold War. The announcement of a major increase in military spending came despite the coronavirus crisis pummeling the economy and as Britain seeks to define its post-Brexit role in the world stage. In a speech to Parliament outlining first conclusions from a big review of foreign policy and defence, Prime Minister Johnson Johnson announced an extra £16.5 billion for the military over the next four years. The defence budget is now just under £42 billion a year. On our assessment of the international situation and our foreign policy goals, I've decided that the era of cutting our defence budget must end, and it ends now. I'm increasing defence spending by £24.1 billion over the next four years. That's £16.5 more than our manifesto commitment, raising it as a share of GDP to at least 2.2%, exceeding our NATO pledge and investing £190 billion over the next four years. More than any other European country and more than any other NATO ally except the United States. The Ministry of Defence has received a multi-year settlement because equipping our armed forces requires long-term investment and our national security in 20 years' time will depend on decisions we take today. I've done this in the teeth of the pandemic amid every other demand on our resources because the defence of the realm and the safety of the British people must come first. China has strongly rebuked the UK, the US, Australia, New Zealand and Canada after being accused of a concerted effort to silence critics in Hong Kong. The countries, which formed the Five Eyes Alliance, criticized China's imposition of new rules to disqualify elected legislators in Hong Kong. They urged Beijing to reverse course. A Chinese foreign ministry spokesman warned countries to stay out of China's affairs, saying, quote, they should be careful or their eyes will be plucked out. He adds that the Chinese never make trouble and are never afraid of anything. Last week, Hong Kong expelled four pro-democracy lawmakers from its legislature after Beijing passed a resolution allowing the city's government to dismiss politicians deemed a threat to national security. In response, all of Hong Kong's pro-democracy lawmakers announced their resignation. For the first time since the UK handed the territory back to China in 1997, the body has almost no dissenting voices. Meanwhile, Ethiopia's army chief has accused the head of the World Health Organization of lobbying in favor of the Tigray People Liberation Front, which is fighting federal troops. General Burhanu Jula claims that Tedros Gabrisis had left no stone unturned to support the TPLF and help them get weapons. The WHO boss is yet to respond to this allegation. He was health minister in the previous Ethiopian government, which was led by the TPLF and is the highest profile Tigrayan abroad. Ethiopia's prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, says the military operation against Tigray is essential to restore law and order in the country. Still to come on The World Today. Santa Claus is not coming to town this year. He's online as a website uses AI to let children interact with him during the COVID-19 pandemic. Details in a moment, stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. 
The UN Refugee Agency says that thousands of civilians are continuing to flee across the border into Sudan to escape the continuing unrest in Ethiopia's northern region of Tigray. The agency also says that most of those feelings are families, sorry, most of those fleeing are families leaving on foot because it has become too dangerous to stay. Ethiopia has denied targeting civilians as it continues its campaign against the Tigrayan People's Liberation Front. Our colleagues at the UN Refugee Agency warned today that a full-scale humanitarian crisis is unfolding and thousands of refugees flee ongoing fighting in Tigray every day to seek safety in eastern Sudan. UNHCR says the influx is unseen over the last two decades in that part of the country. People have been crossing the border of about the rate of about 4,000 per day since November 10th, rapidly overwhelming the humanitarian response on the ground. UNHCR says more than 27,000 have now crossed into Sudan. The federal government is refuting reports by U.S.-based international media organization CNN, which shows men of the Nigerian <laughs> army shooting unarmed NSARS protesters at the Lekki toll gate on October the 20th, 2020. In its report, CNN, using footage of the incident shot with phones by eyewitnesses, presents what it describes as evidence of the Army's responsibility in the violence that occurred at the protest scene. But the Minister of Information and Culture, Ahlaji Lai Mohammed, who addressed a news conference in Abuja today, says the CNN report is a false account of the Lekki incident, describing the report as irresponsible and threatening that the TV network will be sanctioned. Al-Haji Mohammed also restates the federal government's position that the army did not shoot at the protesters and referring to the report of deaths as massacre without bodies. Instead, the minister commends the conduct of the police and army in taking control of the situation by dispersing the protesters. Human rights group Amnesty International had released a report of the timeline of the Lecky shooting showing the movement of soldiers to the scene and the shooting, which it claims resulted in the death of at least 12 people. Alhaji Mohammed also vows that the lady who live streamed the Lecky incident on Instagram, DJ Switch, will be exposed. This information during the NSAS crisis was one DJ switch, real name, Obianuju Catherine Ude, even though she claimed to have authentic evidence of mass killings. Surprisingly, instead of presenting whatever evidence she may have to the judicial panel, she chose to escape from the country under the pretext that her life was in danger. I ask, in danger from who? The military has come out to say they never sought after her. To the best of our knowledge, the police never declared her wanted. Her conduct thus becomes suspect. Who is she fronting for? What is her real motive? Who are our sponsors. Is she, if she has any evidence of killings, why is she not presenting such evidence to the panel? If she was so desperate for asylum in any country, does she have to resort to planted falsehood to tarnish the image of the country just to achieve her aim? In the fullness of time, this lady will be exposed for what she is. I watched the CNN report yesterday. I must tell you that it reinforces the disinformation that is going around and it is blatantly irresponsible and the poor piece of journalistic work by a reputable international news organization. CNN engaged in incredible 
sensationalism and did a great disservice to itself and to journalism. The first instance, CNN, which touted its report as an exclusive investigative report, sadly relied on the same videos that have been circulating on social media without verification. This is very serious, and CNN should be sanctioned for that. We insist that the military did not shoot at protesters at Lucky Toll Gate. They fired blank ammunition in the air. Again, anyone who knows anyone who was killed at the Lucky Toll Gate should head straight to the judicial panel with conclusive <coughs> evidence of such. The National Broadcasting Commission, NBC, had earlier sanctioned Channel's television for using social, the same social media video as a part of its coverage of the Lucky shooting incident. The U EU and UK chief negotiators have stepped back from post-Brexit trade talks after a member of the EU team tested positive for COVID-19. The EU's Michel Barnier said his UK counterpart, Lord David Frost, has agreed to suspend negotiations between them for a short period. Mr. Barnier adds that their teams would continue discussions in full respect of safety guidelines. They are locked in talks as the clock counts down to a December deadline just five weeks away. Both sides are seeking an agreement to govern their trading relationship once the UK post-Brexit transition period ends in January 2021. Fishing rights, post-Brexit comp competition rules, and how any deal would be enforced remain key areas of disagreement. Our village at the North Pole has over 100,000 elves living here. And right now, they're in different workshops making toys. Sitting on Santa's lap and tugging his beard while what posing kind of for toys? a professional photographer at the mall is a long-held annual family tradition. But the coronavirus pandemic means this year, children across the world won't get the chance to tell him what they want for Christmas. But U.S. tech company StoryFile has come up with an AI alternative, creating a website where children can ask Santa questions online instead. StoryFile usually records interviews with people of note, from scientists and astronauts to civil rights icons and Holocaust survivors. Interviewees sit in one place and answer questions on camera. The answers are then prompted by voice activation on their app to give an almost seamless interaction with the subject. The website AskSanta.com is now live until New Year's Eve. Although the app is free to access, they are asking visitors to donate to their charity partners, the American Heart Association and Red Sled Santa Foundation. This whole concept is, is amazing. And what better way for a child to be able to interact with Santa in such a challenging time, for, for any length of time, um, in the comfort of their own home? Kids are all over the country and all over the world are not going to be able to sit on Santa's lap and talk to him and ask questions and have that experience for Christmas. So I said, who better to bring Santa to life and all of these kids can ask him questions and talk to him and tell him what they want uh, than StoryFile. Well, it's nice to see those long-held family traditions alive with technology. That's all for the program. I'm Akaite Afia. Have a great evening and stay safe.